I'm here to talk to you today about some cause of inference issues with observational data um, and hopefully cause a bit of controversy with some of the research that we did last year. Um, so it's re I'm really happy to see so many uh, familiar faces. It's a good group to come along every month. It's good to see you all. Okay, first of all, um, Grant Institute, uh, I have to give us a plug. Um, it's a public policy research institute at Melbourne Uni um, that is not exactly a part of Melbourne Uni. We're privately funded. We've got an endowment and live off that. We're currently recruiting for three people. So if you know anyone who's a city's person, so urban economics or town planning or these sorts of things, we're recruiting as a fairly senior position. Um, we're also re recruiting for an associate and a senior associate. So that's basically a fairly quantitative um, job with uh, lots of qualitative stuff as well. If you've got a keen interest in policy or anything like that, or know anyone who does, please forward them to our website. Okay, so what do I want to talk about? Now, there's this, if you can think, imagine the universe of interesting policy questions, the big pink circle there. And that includes things from, you know, what is the optimal price to pay for medication to what, what books should we teach our children um, at school? Now, some of these have data. There's a lot of available data to use, and not all of it covers interesting policy questions. At the same time, there are these kind of experimental data sets, or data sets generated by experiments or natural experiments, that we can use to get really good causal estimates. I'm, I think those are great, but I, there's this much bigger set of data that covers interesting policy issues that don't have really well-defined causal properties. Now, I just want to talk about those tonight. So, just, just a quick stir. Yep. This is the size of the circles proportional to the amount of data or to the amount of information? <laughs> oh, I wouldn't want to have it a guess. Um, so, what my talk about is tonight, first of all, um, I'll tell you a bit about our report last year, Graduate Winners, um, which generated quite a stir. Um, basically, how we did some of the analysis for that in R. Um, so going through the process from choosing the data itself, choosing the appropriate model, um, what sort of independent variables should we use? These are important things. I won't talk about this, I was going to, but I think the talk is probably running a little bit long as it is. And then move on to the inference. We really want to discover some causal effect of university on other things. Um, the problem is that we can't randomly assign a university pill to some people and a control pill to another, or a placebo to other people, so we don't get to do a, like a randomised control trial and, and observe the causal effect. Okay, so graduate winners. This is Andrew Norton's report. Um, we spend about $7 billion a year on higher education tuition subsidies. That's on top of the research money, um, and that's uh, exclusive of the interest subsidy that goes on HEX. Okay, so $7 billion is a reasonable sum, especially in kind of budget constrained times. We're asking, is that good value for money? So, graduates earn a lot more than non-graduates. Some of that is because university makes them earn more. It teaches them skills that allows them to go and get high paying jobs. Um, not all of it is though. Some of those people would have earned more even if they hadn't have gone to university. So it's difficult to work out cause and effect here. Um, this is really justifiable. It's justifiable to you know, use government's monopoly on violence to tax people um, to pay for tuition. If <laughs> graduates provide large externalities, they, they help society, they maybe produce things that would not otherwise be produced, and they would not study in absence of the tuition. Okay? So that's our our decision rule. If um, graduates provide large externalities and they would not study without a uh, tuition subsidy, then that justifies the government taxing people to pay for tuition. Um, there are lots of really good claims on the government purse and we're just asking whether this is one of them. So here you can see a lovely distribution of incomes. So the bottom of the income is the 20th percentile of earners, the top of the um, bar is the 60th percentile, so this is basically kind of towards the bottom end. And you can see people who study medicine, dentistry, law, commerce, over their life, they earn between 
three million and four and a half million over there working career versus between one and two million for someone without a degree. So there are large private benefits to um, to going to university. You earn a lot more over your career. Now, given there are so many private benefits, people will go and study, even if the price is maybe a little bit higher. What our question is, is how much additional public benefits do they produce? So, one of the problems with this kind of research question is that you can't go and just compare graduates to non-graduates. Um, graduates may volunteer more, but that could be because they've got pushy parents or a really supportive peer group. Um, and so we can't just compare the two and say that that's causal. Um, they may you know, reach their children, they may uh, I don't know, help out at school or, or vote with more kind of passion or all those sorts of things. Um, we can't really distinguish this as causal by just comparing the graduates and non-graduates, which is why we need to do analytics. So on the, well, what we did basically, we took a, a collection of surveys um, with about 55,000 people. So it's a general social survey, which is run by the ABS. They've got 30, 35,000 observations. There's um, HILDA, which is a longitudinal study done by the Melbourne Institute. They've followed the same 20,000 people for 11 years now. Um, and they pay them $100 a year to do the survey. It's pretty intrusive. They ask them their bank balance. They ask them how much their house is worth, whether they believe in God, all these sorts of things, and trace that over time, how happy they are, how good their relationship is with, with their spouse. Pretty interesting sort of data set. Um, and in the Australian Survey of Social Attitudes, it's not such a good survey in terms of data quality, it's a postal survey, um, but it is, they ask some really interesting questions, you know, how do you feel about the Lebanese, or something like that, which, which is an interesting question from a public um, good perspective. So from these surveys, we go through them and look at some dependent variables. Um, we chose about 70, which may constitute uh, a, a non financial benefit. Um, so everything from life satisfaction to um, how do you find the Vietnamese? Would you mind having one marry into your family versus I don't feel comfortable living next door? Uh, how much do I volunteer? Uh, care for the elderly? All these sorts of things. Um, so there's a big problem with this. You've probably seen this cartoon. It's an XKCD cartoon. If you've got lots of dependent variables and, you run, and you've got the same independent variables, you're likely to get, you know, False positives. Um, there's a really big case for reading the literature, understanding what sort of um, effects you should expect. If you're a Bayesian, you can kind of program that into your priors. If you're not, you can go and read the literature and uh, you know criticise your own results. This is good science. So if you're doing many, many of these sort of models in R, um, I don't want to talk you through scripts tonight, but I've just put a few up there. I'm going to put the slides online afterwards. You can print. Um, but you can basically run through a whole bunch of dependent variables and run the same model over and over again and then just collect all the results into a single file at the end which you can scroll through. Um, there is a bit of code here, eval pass text equals, which I've been told you should never ever ever use, but um, it's use useful nonetheless. So one of the things, one of the problems you've got, you select your dependent variables. The problem is some of them, like BMI, are continuous. Others, whether you have a job, are binary. Others, labour force participation is either you're out of labour force, you're unemployed, or you're employed. That's like a factor. You may have um, ordered. What's your life satisfaction? Good, bad, excellent, super. Um, so these like it variables which are ordered. Um, you need to go through and when there's 70 or 100 different variables, you have to select a different model for each of them. And so R has uh, accommodates this quite nicely. There's in the um, linear models, I use um, the linear model and LMAR, which is like a mixed model. Um, GLM for probe and logic style models with GLMER and Bayes GLM, which I find to be a little bit more stable. Like it variables, I use Bayes Polar in the ARM package and fact data MLOT package. And MLogit package is really quite powerful. Um, again, if you're doing this sort of work, uh, I'll make these slides available online and you can um, look at those packages. There's a pretty big problem with uh, 
choosing the independent variables. Uh, can I get a show of hands? How many of you do predictive analytics? You'd say. Who does like inferential analytics? Who does no analytics? <laughs> What's well, data analysis? <laughs> data analysis. So you, you produce charts of. I analyze data and make inferences from research data. Is that analytics or is that so something that's else? Inference. Isn't it? <clears throat> A big problem with the inference is that you've got some independent variable, that, a key independent variable that you're interested in. I want to know what happens if I educate someone. What happens if the government fills its role and increases the number of graduates? What's going to happen to volunteering? The problem is that it may have a direct effect and it has these indirect effects. The indirect effects, if you necessarily include those, um, then some of the causal effect of universities is going to be captured in these. And the parameter estimate that you've got for university education is not is not only a causal effect. The other problem though is that if you remove these, then you've got committed variables bias. There may be some completely independent reason why industry employment or income or, or marital status affects volunteering. So what do you do? Here's where instrumental variables come to the rescue. The basic idea here is that you want to um, have an experiment. That's what you really want. The problem is that you don't have an experiment. You want to assign some people more education, other people less education, and the ethics committee won't let you. So what uh, some people have used, um, there's a famous study from the States by Kruger, um, where they used the draft lottery as an instrument. Because you could get out of the draft by um, going to university, there's a cohort in the, who were born in the late 40s and early 50s who have more education than the cohorts on both sides of them. So it's almost as though you've got some people who have been randomly assigned more education and other people less education. Um, there's another famous study from the 90s by David Carr where they look at the distance from university when you were 17 as, as like an experiment for whether you, should, uh, whether you go to university. The people, there should be no reason why um, the distance from university when you're 17 affects your earnings when you're 30, other than through its effect on whether you go to university. So people who live very close to university, it's like they're in a treatment group. People who live further away from university, it's like they're in a control group. And you can get these quasi-experimental settings. Um, so I just wanted to give you this, because we all like coffee. Let's, let's imagine that you're a coffee seller. Um, you can't store this coffee, this is magical coffee that combusts after hours getting it, so there's no storage issues. And you, you, your entire business plan is you have, you have to profit maximise, and you, would, you need to know the elasticity of demand for your coffee. The problem is, you don't know where the elasticity, which is the slope of your demand, that is, you, you, want, you want to know how much can you expect to sell in terms of dollars if you put the price up. How about if you put the price down? You need to know this to be able to make a business choice. It could be that, it could be that. You simply do not know. Now, a lot of people who may be in, I mean, you could have the best predictive model in the world. Um, if you don't have some exogenous change in the price of coffee, you simply cannot identify that slope. You have no idea what the elasticity of demand is, and you cannot simulate that to work out what your own change in revenue should be. It's, there, no predictive model will ever get near that. No big data will ever help you work this out. So the idea is that you'd find something like a plague of locusts where they produce coffee, or rainfall in Brazil, something that's going to be a supply shock. And you'd model, first of all, the price of coffee as being dependent on the rainfall in Brazil, let's say, and then take that fitted, the fitted values of that price and stick it in the second equation, which would be your modelling the quantity. Now, that of course has the problem that the uncertainty for this equation should be factored into this equation, so your standard errors are wrong. 
Um, but R has some really great um, built-in functions to help you get around that. So IV reg in AER, which is an applied econometric methods or something, and PLM for panel data, allows you to use um, these instruments and that helps you out quite a bit. There are still really big issues with this sort of approach though. If you, um, uh, good instruments are almost impossible to find. Um, if, if you have a really good instrument, you can get a 10 year old you know, MIT if you really want. Uh, there are small sampling issues. Um, under, in small samples, they're biased towards an OLS estimate. They're not magical estimators. They're pretty good for a lot of things, but they're not magical. So that's kind of, if you follow textbooks, that's what you should do. What if you've got no instrument? You still want to estimate a causal effect. And what do you do? There are second best solutions. Um, and I think matching is a, a good one. So here's Hilda. Hilda is that study I was talking about, the survey I was talking about before. It's 20,000 people over 11 years. Um, here is a density plot of uh, incomes and age from, with graduates and non-graduates. If, if you're running a regression and the key independent variable is university education, but you've got you know, limited overlap here, you've got uh, complete imbalance between your treatment and your control group, your estimates bump. What do you do? Now, so the idea of uh, propensity score matching is to basically create a synthetic control group. The idea is that you find, you, I want graduates and non-graduates who are very, very similar on all other characteristics. Okay? Um, all the people who are not like graduates, I'm just going to throw them out. They're not very useful to me. But if we introduce more university places, they're not going to go to university anyway. Um, they're not the marginal person. And then on this restricted group, we do our standard regression analysis. Okay? So, Ruben and Rosenbaum, they came up with the idea of propensity score matching, which is where you'd basically run a model to predict the treatment. This is dependent on the assignment to treatment being um, conditional on the observed ver observable variables. If it's a lot of un unobservable variables, then your, uh, your estimator falls down. For each of the treated observations, what we're going to do is we're going to... Okay, so we're trying to find people who are just as likely to go to university using their... whether their mum went to university, whether their, their, what their age is, what their gender is, um, what state they live in, whether they live in a rural centre or an urban centre. For each person who did go to university, we're going to find somebody who didn't go to university who is about as, as likely to have gone to university. And we throw out the rest. And we do our regression analysis on the remaining bit. So I'm not going to talk you through the code. Um, in the ARM package, um, they've got a little hand little function for this. So here's our original um, treatment, which is the blue. That's our university graduates. And our control, people who didn't go to university. After we do propensity score matching, they're much more balanced. Okay? They're still not perfectly balanced, but you can see it's converged. We basically locked off this peak. With age, there's quite a no noticeable improvement. That's the distribution before, this distribution after. So our, our untreated people here are much more similar in their age profile um, than they were before. Okay, so what, what's the effect on your estimates? If we just do a, a straight estimate of, um, what's this, life satisfaction in log odds on treatment, University graduates are a little bit less happy. Um, any, anyone have any theories why that would be the case? 
existential anxiety. Existential anxiety, could you Leah? Um, anyone here have existential anxiety? <laughs> I know everyone put their hand up. <laughs> if we can just do a straight linear regression, we control for our covariates. Um, we shrink that towards zero. Once I do propensity score matching, there is no difference. Um, if I use mixed effects, there is even less no difference. <laughs> Ignorance is a bliss. Sorry? Ignorance. Ignorance is a bliss? bliss? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They know more, they still have because they know what they give. I sat on the tram this morning um, next to these two ladies who worked at David Jones and they were talking really loudly. You know those conversations you can't help but be subjected to? And they were so happy. Um, they've been working there their entire careers and absolutely happy. I don't know anyone that happy. So you, that's what I'm saying. Two, two sides go to you find someone um, from each, from each say in this case a university graduate, you find a non-graduate who has similar attributes. Yeah. In a sample like Hilda, is that actually possible? Are there enough people that to, to match one yeah, to one, yeah. or do you have to count them twice? Like, that was twenty thousand people. Um, I'm doing it on twelve or thirteen independent variables. Okay. Um, and does it make a difference if you do it the other way around? If you find the non-university goers or match them with the university goers, does that make a difference? That's really interesting. I've not tried it. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. You know, do that tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be interested to know whether you just have to. I'll get the card later on. Oh, no, no, definitely do that. That sounds like a fascinating project. Um, there are some pretty big issues with propensity score matching, it's not exactly in favour in academia. Um, basically, the propensity model that you use, that, so if I go back here, so you use like a probit model I've used with university, whether you're a graduate as a dependent variable, or I've just got a data frame with all the independent variables. Um, the problem is if you change those independent variables, uh, your matching is completely different and your estimates are completely different. So it's not a very good model. It's not very robust. Um, and so the Smith and Todd paper kind of destroys the the, the Hadja and Wahba paper, which um, is the main one that was kind of proposing um, propensity score matching as a solution to some of our problems. So over, over Christmas I went for a long bike ride and it was up through the, uh, along the Goldman River and I started thinking about this while cycling and I had this idea that what about if you use a more robust model? We we have these in, in kind of predictive analytics. Something like a random forest, a beautiful, like very, very robust model. No individual uh, observation occurs in many of the trees and not many of the independent, independent variables occur in many of the trees. So this could be a, a fascinating way of, of matching observations. So for those who are not initiated into um, the world of uh, carts and random forests, I've got a quick primer for you. Okay, can I get a show of hands? How many people used R in the last week? Okay, so what I want to do, of those people, put your hand up again. Uh, okay, I want to improve the purity of this group. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a precision rule uh, who also has a degree in a quantitative discipline? Yeah, everyone who used R this week. <laughs> okay, so what what a cart is, is it's trying to improve the purity. Had the computer searches over all the possible rules to split people into those who are more likely to have used R this week and those who are less likely to have used R this week. The first split is the one that improves the purity the most. So it's one rule here. It's age, whether you're less than 23. If you're less than 23, you've, in this sample, you've not completed university. So 98.5% of those have not completed university. If you're more than 23, 76% uh, have not completed university. Okay, that's, that's the first split. The second split, we want to improve the purity still. Um, did your mother have her post-school education? If no, then there's 84%, so only 16% or 15% of people here have a university education. If you're over 23 and your mother had a post-school education, 
45% have a university degree. So if you're a bit older and your mum went to uni or something, then you're, there's a much higher likelihood you've gone to university. Um, this continues, this, this particular trio grew has 81 terminal loads. What happens is that you put your entire sample down one of these trees and it, it sends everyone down here. And then anyone who winds up in this, any two people who wind up in the same terminal load, we say that they have a proximity of one. Okay, so Dan and I, I reckon we're pretty similar people. Um, we both work together, he's a couple of years older than me, we're both educated, you know, we both do quantitative stuff. We're going to fall down this tree into roughly the same spot. Okay? And so Dan and I will have a proximity of one. There's maybe someone else, that's your hand. Um, there's maybe someone else in the room who is quite dissimilar to me, and I will, may have a proximity of zero with them. Now, what a random forest does is grows many of these trees. Okay, so thanks to explosion computing power, we can grow a thousand of these. Each of those trees is grown with only a subset of the columns and a subset of the rows. The idea is that we don't want a single in independent variable or a single observation um, kind of biasing our results or pushing the results in a certain direction. So, what we do then is we get the proximity matrix for each of these trees. We add them all together, we divide them by the number of, uh, of trees. Okay? So if I have a proximity score of 0.6 with Leah, um, then that means that in 60% of trees, Leah and I wind up in the same terminal node. If I've got a proximity score of 0, Leah and I wind up in no terminal nodes together. Now, this is a pretty powerful concept because what a tree does when it grows, it doesn't include all the independent variables necessarily. It only includes them if a sufficient improvement to purity can be made. The great thing about this is if you've got nuisance variables on your right hand side, they're not necessarily included. Okay? So you're not going to be getting any of these, this, well, you're going to be getting less of the spurious correlation that you may get in um, like a, a GLM, like a probe or something. So, my idea, run around the forest for the treatment. For each treated observation, you select the untreated observation with the closest proximity. Save the proximities. We run a regression and we use those saved proximities as weights. Now, the beauty of this is that what we do is somebody who's maybe they've got a proximity of 0.3 um, with a graduate is going to matter much less the estimate that somebody's got a proximity of 0.9, okay? Um, and then with small samples you may need to do this over and over to try and get some idea of the distribution and parameter outcomes. Uh, I've found it to be a little bit unstable on small samples. Um, you should grow a lot of trees. There is one big issue here if you've got a large data set, let's say a 20,000 by 20,000 data set, uh, that's a lot of cells. How? many bytes in each cell? Two or three of them. So you're talking, if you've got a thousand trees, you're saving a 20,000 by 20,000 matrix for each of those trees. You, I did one of those this afternoon and I ran out of my eight memory like that. So it's not suited to really big um, um, surveys. Okay, so I've got some implementation here. If you want, you can download it later. Here's the cool bit though. That's what you get from propensity score matching. That's one of the kind of, in applied stuff, that's a standard. Here's my method. We get rid of a whole bunch of this, we get rid of a whole bunch of this, and we get almost complete matching on the right-hand side yeah. there. <coughs> this is the income. We get rid of a whole bunch of this, and we get a much tighter fit down there. We end up with a control group who is so much more like our treatment group than beforehand. Um, we can probably start thinking that these are similar people, which is nice. So this is before and after shot. Before, before any um, any matching at all. This is after. We've got almost the same population. So just a quick question. So this, does this solve the problem you mentioned that it's not robust to, uh, uh, I think, for, uh, 
conventional model would be used? So you were saying that if you change the model, then you can get different scores. Yeah. Okay, so random forest is random. If you've got a small sample, it's uh, you're going to need to um, bootstrap it or something to get a reasonable distribution. Um, I think it is more uh, it is more robust. In the experiments I've done so far, it's been more robust. Uh, I'm it's still experimental for me. And if anyone wants to talk about this later on, if anyone has any experimental data sets they'd like to benchmark this against, I'd be really really happy to try it out with that. Um, okay, so here's. Uh, the little famous Lalonde data set. So this is a um, randomized control trial of a, um, a policy intervention that basically trained, well, it, it placed people in a job um, who were unemployed, and you had to be unemployed to get into this program. They would place you into the job, you had to stay for a certain period, you get training while you're going. And then they came back a few years later to see if that made an impact on the income. The randomized control trial has an estimate of this. This is one measure of the See, if I, what we do is take the treatment of that group and pair it up against the US's version of, the, of Hilda in the 1970s. Okay? So I use CPS3 here, and there's, this does not look like this. I use propensity score matching here. This looks like this, but unfortunately it does not look like my causal effect. When I use my uh, proximity score matching, it looks a lot more similar. So, look, there is a good reason why we should think this is potentially an improvement. We're going to try and pick people who are more like the um, treatment group than the existing control group, and we do it in a more robust way than the standard GLM model. Thank you. Looks like your, your error bars are pretty big. Yes. With the proximity score matching. Yep. Does that mean that? It's pretty small, um, pretty small sample. It's got about 290 people on either side. Uh, 290 treated and then 140 untreated because there were some duplications and you don't want to be including people is that, so twice the control group. So is the reason for the smaller errors on the RCT because they had a bigger sample? Uh, no, I wouldn't recess it. Um, they have a randomized control trial and with a sample of about 600 people, there was 700 people. They're quite likely to get um, better estimates. This is remember the, the control group here is completely synthetic. We've just pulled it from Hilda, and we've matched people who are a lot very similar to the people on uh, in the treatment from an experiment. Cool. What's so, the rate of scale on that? This is dollars of income uh, improvement. Yearly or quarterly? Uh, this is in 1978. Okay, so for a bit of fun, I thought this up for this afternoon. I'll paste these two um, pictures in. This is your BMI of your lifetime, um, with and without university. So you can imagine the counterfactual that you never went to university. How chubby would you be? Um, females, they they peak a little bit higher if they didn't go to university. Peak a lot lower if they did go to university. This is um, without any matching at all. Once I do matching, unfortunately all that disappears. Or most of it disappears. There's very little effect. The university doesn't make me that much skinnier. Uh, that's it. Does anything, anyone have any questions? Comments? Death threats? So, I guess just in a normal research context, there's this big question about what covariates you want to in include. Um, you know, with the bad controls, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just in general, you know, like, so, I mean, if you don't include the right covariates, one, you may not capture the, the, the controlling factors that you want. Or as you say, you might incorporate some mediating process or something that's a consequence of your effective interest. Uh, how does what you're doing map on to that traditional kind of concepts of, well, knowing what covariates are actually um, that you've got an adequate number of covariates yeah. and that also that you don't um, capture implicit consequences of the causal effect anyway. Yeah, this is, I found the most difficult thing with our research last year. Um, so you can drop out a lot of your independent variables if you've got a good instrument. Um, and 
because we don't actually have, we didn't have that draft escape in Australia. Um, we didn't have, we don't have in Hilda, we don't have distance from, it, from university when you're 17. Um, so we can't get a very good uh, treatment and control group in the IV language. Um, so, yeah, I left a lot of my controls in. The reason being was that most of my, uh, in most of my models, income was doing most of the work. We know that university does um, in, increase your income, um, but that's not going to be a reason that stops you from going to university. Um, if I mean, often you go to university for in, for the additional income, and it's incidental to that additional income that you can then afford a bougie lifestyle of going and helping the poor. Um, I so I left quite a few of them in. Um, so and would you conceptualise? Partial interpretation. So would you conceptualise income as part of the causal effect of a university? I mean, in the sense that yep, certainly. it's not you don't there's not. So if you control for income, that's sort of taking out some of the effect of university. But in some senses, if you, that's the mechanism by which university makes you a Better. person who say, we have lots of money, so you've got lots of money to give to charity or something like yeah. that. So you, a, that's sort of the mechanism by which, say, university leads to it. Yeah. That, in a sense, is the causal effect of a sure. university. Sure. Uh, in terms of public policy question, though, it's, you're asking whether people are dissuaded from going to university by increasing fees. Okay, so if the causal effect on volunteering or giving to charity or these sorts of things is through the additional income, which we're saying is one of the main reasons people do go to university, then it's a less strong point. So the, the fact that university causes maybe additional charity, charitable giving is um, less of an argument for additional tuition subsidies if it's going only through the income channel. I'm, I'm not an analytical person, so I was trying to boil this down. So your proximity matching, yep. you're trying to reduce, I suppose, the number of um, factors yep. that um, give rise to this. Um, and just based on this last slide here, which of your results is correct or true? So if you're saying that, um, if you're asking my point to find out if you, you know, university makes you skinny, um, and you know you can actually say that the top graphs, the different you see, is that quite controversial. So if the problem with this is that you've got this big um, kind of selection effect. If you have somebody who's got a certain sort of family or a certain sort of peer group that makes makes them both more likely to exercise and more likely to go to university, um, then you and we probably do see that sort of thing. You probably expect that somebody who's gone to university is skinnier, and it's not necessarily just because of university. It's because they've got all these other things in their life that makes them do both. Right. Um, once we select, I mean, if you think about why we include independent variables in models, it's not because the physical aspect of gender has any causal effect on anything. It's because of the, the kind of things that go along with being male or female. Um, I mean, it's not just because you've got broad shoulders that you make more money. Um, there are a whole bunch of other kind of reasons that are unobserved, that, that are highly correlated with that, that one independent variable of your gender. Um, so by matching on these, I, I believe we're matching also on uh, certain sorts of unobservable variables, <coughs> to a degree. Um, so your random voice method is kind of like a averaging of different uh, principles for models. Yep. There's been a lot of work on this, on propensity score matching, and people who have taken various approaches to matching. Um, I don't know the entire literature, so I can't answer your question. Sorry. So similar to that, have you tried or anyone else tried a clustering approach for the matching? You know? Um, or? No. Uh, well, I'm not sure if anyone else has. I've not. Do you think it would provide uh, better, similar results? Where you look at the distance between points in the cluster for the map as, as opposed to uh, the weight? I've not thought about that. Well, but I will. <laughs> if you 
you put in your program as far as together, if you got a lot of variables to put again which are not in the event of each other, um, does the fact you've got a lot to cluster around one set of correlated variables or all correlated together, does that bias the sort of treats you get and sort of what it's considered close? Because it matches on a lot of those things. And so you can decrease based on a lot of things which essentially the picture of the one underlying variable. So a lot of the independent variables in any sort of model are going to be correlated. Um, well, yeah. not in the Sorry? Not in the best in this case. Not in the what? So they're not in the best in this case. Yeah. Um, I would guess we, when we were in a random forest, the probability of any two um, independent variables appearing in the same tree are relatively small. So right. all because it randomly subsets. Um, but supposing you have something where you've got um, something like gender is there or something that, um, so you've got a hell of a lot of variables that are correlated to that to various extent. Yeah, that's the majority of the things you're testing. Yeah. Uh, or you know, it's just that you have something like that where you've got something that's not in the best in this case, but you have a correlated does it come up? Uh, is there a reason? That, like, why would you think it comes up with a bear bias towards that? Or it's going to go back to this? Yeah. So, again, I don't think I've thought about or understand your question sufficiently to do anything. But I'd love to talk to you afterwards if possible. Boothy? Yeah. In terms of number of variables, have you looked at like, what the minimum number of variables you need? No, no, no. Uh, it's an experimental technique and I've still got quite a bit of playing to do to see how robust it is. In what I've looked at so far, it seems to be more robust than fancy score matching, but that's not really saying all that much. Can you have a guess at the number of variables in the screen? Just a guess. So the one I was playing with this afternoon had 500 observations or 400. The observation that I didn't find that to be very robust until I really increased the number of trees. Um, so with, with small samples, you need to have a lot of trees before you start to get robust matching. I'm wondering if it's on a sample set of 30 people, four variables, and that's not going to help you. I don't think so. Um, although I don't think that many, I don't think density score matching would necessarily help you. I mean, you remember the whole point is to throw away more variables before you're doing your regression. If you've got a few treatment variables and some control variables, and you've only got 30 in total, you end up with 12 observations or something. It's not enough to do much good. I'm wondering if I can control group before I do the study. As in, if I have a lot of people to select from, can I pick the perfect <coughs> control group by a range of psychological, physiological scales and all the people I've access to yeah, I, and then pick two groups which are most... <coughs> you know, yeah, I, mean, I, I, I think that would be one. actually a reasonable um, use. You're a psychologist. Are you able to tell us about the impact that this... Sorry? Are you able to tell us about the impact that this study has had on... Um, yeah, so... Uh, it's... Andrew has, um, uh, okay, so the outcome of this study was basically that um, we found that there, there definitely to be some uh, broadly defined kind of causal impact of um, university education on some variables. So of the 70, there were probably half a dozen um, that seemed to be pretty consistent. And that was consistent with literature as well. So, I mean, you'd expect if you're running 70 progressions on the, on the same independent variable, then you're going to get some uh, spruce correlation. But the fact that it appears in both decent IV studies and our study, we're fairly comfortable with that. The magnitude, though, of the, um, the private returns relative to the public returns, probably not enough to dissuade people from um, going to university if we increase tuition fees. So basically, 
our argument is that we should be booking more of the, um, the university tuition cost to X. So instead of having a doctor, let's go back here. So when you're earning what, two, three times as much somebody who didn't go to university um, from doing medicine and you're receiving a, a subsidy um, each year of twenty or thirty thousand dollars from taxpayer. Um, you have to kind of wonder whether that's good policy. It's almost as though we seem to be giving a gift to people to do some some degree, especially dentistry, law, and medicine. Uh, law, most people pay most of their course law and economics, these sorts of disciplines. But especially medicine, and dentistry, they pay very little, yet they still earn a massive wage premium. Yeah, medicine is interesting because they said like, oh, would they study if they didn't go to uni? Which is not really a valid thing to ask. No, example. would they study if we increase the tuition? But remember, we've got a HEC system in Australia. It's a contingent loan scheme. You don't have to pay for your university until you earn more than $50,000 a year. 55? Um, so if you book the entire, you know, $120,000 to HEX, you can only book the $80,000 at the moment. But if we were to increase that while increasing the tuition, then there's no reason that anybody would be would be constrained in going to university. And it would save the government. It is. What, three to seven million dollars a year? Sorry? Like, like some people don't like having debt. Like, so you put a debt that like, you can never pay. The, the beautiful thing about HEX though is that it, if you fall beneath that, that threshold, you don't have to pay it. So it is actually quite a good scheme. It just, you just face a high marginal tax rate when you do earn a lot. And doctors earn a lot. So I don't mind if they pay their education. Yeah, but they earn a lot of doctors. Sure. Yeah. But so they actually hold doctors. Like, is that something that you take into account? Yeah. In your it, the question is whether they're likely to forego um, the extra couple of million dollars of salary of their lifetime because of an extra hundred thousand dollars of debt. Um, yeah, I, I had a quick look through the report yesterday. I haven't seen it before. Uh, no, this is a very interesting conclusion. I just want, what the thing that occurred to me when I read through it was, I guess this must have come up, um, to what extent can you say that that might be true for tertiary education? Might also be true for secondary education. Yeah. So there's less of a redistributive problem with secondary education. Most people finish. Um, so it's not as though you've got high income earning um, people who didn't go to university paying essentially for people who did go to university to have gone to university. Whereas most people finish go to school. And so there's less of this shifting between people in the same profile. Yeah, but it's a little sum game, anyway. All you're doing is you're saying, rather than the government paying for it, the individuals can pay for it. Yeah. And you could apply the same argument to secondary or even primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is essentially the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Yeah. Secondary education is the same as primary education. Though when, though when you have only you know, 35 percent of people going to university um, and 100 percent of people paying mm. for that tuition that's being subsidised, then it's um, maybe not the most equitable use of money. Mm. There are many, many great claims on the public purse, and I'm not convinced that subsidising people to go and earn more later on is the best claim. I was wondering what your thoughts were on kind of benefits that aren't captured yeah. by the data. So um, looking at your top uh, university graduates, a lot of those industries, one of the critical things about the education is the sorts of decisions that people make. Yeah, certainly. And obviously there's a if you're just going to express it in financial terms, there's a cost to making the bad decisions. So I was wondering if you could talk to the issue about what's not captured and what you think is important. We consider that quite a bit. Um, it's probably more salient for uh, maybe um, social enterprises is things where there are very few returns. So if somebody's going to go and work for engineers without borders their entire lives, um, then we're very happy if they don't have to pay their university. They're probably creating huge amounts of public benefit. Um, and the, tu the tuition subsidy may be what gets them in. 
at the same time within big businesses. I mean, you yeah. know, so, Sergey Brin and Larry Page have changed the world and they've been very handsomely rewarded for this. And a lot of you know, people who've done big technological, technological things have been rewarded and that's probably sufficient to have got them there in the first place. You know, firms <coughs> pay for good people and the decisions that they can make. Firms <laughs> mostly pay for good people. I guess like risk assessment is a good example where you don't necessarily get paid for having a void in a risk because you won't know that it's, um, you know, whereas when there is convention rates, um, people are variety for example. Yeah. Everybody knows about it as a big pulse, but that interplay between you know, good decision making and cost and some complicated issues for the firm to capture. Um, yeah. I'm not sure the university tuition subsidy is the best way of addressing that. You're looking into um, the social benefits of people who go to university and end up having a uh, large income. Are you looking into the possibility that some of the correlation between the high income and the social benefit might be an inverse correlation? For example, you just claim that doctors earn a lot. Uh, a GP will learn more if they spend less time with each patient. Yeah. So maybe the people who would be giving uh, the most to society would be the mm -hmm. people who would be earning less in your cohort. Yeah, and I, I really do buy that argument. I think that's a very good argument. Um, it's one of the reasons we do, uh, like I wholly believe in HEX. I think HEX is an excellent system because it means people who want to go and use, I mean, if you are very happy to be a school teacher and give back to the community, you'll never have to pay more than 3 or 4% of your income in HEX. Um, if you want to go and be an investment banker, you'll pay the whole 8% um, in HEX repayments. But you know, people who are even volunteers, they pay nothing in HEX. They never pay for their education. People who do theatre don't have to pay for their education because they're never going to earn more than 55000 <laughs> But more commonly, they're going to earn, it's, they may at some point, and basically the hex they will pay off eventually, but it will be drawn out over four <laughs> years of their life rather than an investment banker yeah. who pays it off in 10. Exactly. So, sorry, this, I haven't quite worked out this question yet, but um, what, what you're doing, you can investigate fairly crude questions, like if the government was to change the amount of money it spent supporting university education by a big amount or not. You can investigate that because in effect you can, well, the mechanism will do it. But if you want to look at sort of tidier, uh, smaller questions, like for instance, suppose the cutoff for having to pay hex was 50,000 versus 75,000. Yeah. And maybe the percentage was different or maybe, you know, if you want to investigate such a more complicated question, you, I don't know that you're going to get very far no, by agree. this method, but it seems to me that you ought to be able to, by fairly similar methodologies, by given that you've got databases on where people sit and what they've done and what their income is, you ought to be able to somehow um, make some sort of prediction of how things might change if the government policy was changed, even if you can't say that it's, you know, based on what they actually did do. It's sort of based partly on a, on where they currently stand and partly on a model of what they would do yeah, given yeah. where they. No. That's what economists do, don't they? So economists build all these little micro simulation models. And yeah, yeah, but I think it'd be nice if you could have models that use the data where the data was there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and only use the made up bits where you had no choice. <laughs> Yeah. Um, You're not saying anything about economists there, are you? No, 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 no. Oh, no. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah, it's a pretty crude uh, method, I agree. Yeah, yeah but um, you, I, I wouldn't like to denigrate it too much in the sense that you, it's one of these questions where you don't have to get a good answer, you just have to get a better answer than other people are getting. Yeah. And for some of these questions, people are currently getting very, very bad answers. One of the bad things about Australian research into higher education, there are maybe half a dozen researchers, full stop. Um, one of them 
uses regression techniques. All the rest of them say that uh, without much data at all to support, um, higher education causes public good. <laughs> and then government goes, oh, that means we should you know, give more to universities, doesn't it? Um, there's an argument for giving money to universities, it's not necessarily because graduates produce public goods. Professors may. So, so what's your recommendation as a result of this? Is it to reduce government funding to universities? Uh, divert. Okay, so, well, look, there's probably a much better call on these funds um, in primary schooling or infant schooling. Um, you, you invest money in the, into infant schooling, and you yield a much larger return. Um, you could, the government, we estimate, could save between three and seven billion dollars by basically booking all the tuition costs to HEX um, and use that money to uh, give back to taxpayers or to help out children, you know, scholarships, all these sorts of things that actually do, we know, we know have effects. What are the next step after the implement of your policy? Would be like, ah, why, why are we paying subsidizing tax? Would you adopt that and just with the interest like, subsidy, um, mate? Correct. What? With the interest subsidy? Yeah, the, the subsidy of tax. Yeah. Like, the, the, the money doesn't come from the law. No, exactly. Yeah, so why not just adopt tax subsidy as well and just have like a system like the US money that they have like 400 tax? Yeah. They're torn. We made 400,000 to pay pro to We've made, a pretty deliberate, deliberate for the, the rich. We've made a very deliberate policy decision to have HEX because it helps equity, it allows people who, don't, who are kind of liquidity constrained to go to university. Um, and that's an excellent policy, I think. It's certainly allowed a lot of people in the room to go to university and should allow other people to go to university. So, so on the other hand, if you subsidize the tuition more, you don't need HEX at all. When you sub, sort of, yeah, with the European system. So, I guess one, one of the big problems that we're concerned with is in Europe, in Germany or France, 20-25% uh, of people who finish high school go to university. In Australia, it's 35% of people who finish high school go to university. They have free education, and therefore they don't offer many places. When people pay for their education, universities can afford to offer more places. If you want to have more educated people, you have to have those people paying for. Otherwise, people just restrict the number of places. Oh, it is. What, what you decide is like the public good. Whether it's good to have educated people, or whether you want to um, import all your skills, which is. But it's like, it's really. The research is that you've done is able to support your. Like, well, like your pre health views. Same as the researchers in academia. Like, you choose different variables, you get different results. <laughs> and with that insight, I think we should probably. <laughs> Can I ask uh, a general question sure. about how R is uh, accept accepted in, uh, in the public sector? Um, or the people, or the public sector doesn't, does it not care about what tools you use? To my experience, um, my only experience in public sectors at Treasury, and they don't use R at all. Um, the ABS does a bit, but Treasury does not. They use um, EVUs and MATLAB. Um, and their concern, I think, is partly because the people who are deciding on software have fears about security and open source stuff in general. Um, so they don't allow Google Chrome or, or Chromium on, on computers. It's only allowed to have, use Explorer. Um, <laughs> this is why they, this is why they <laughs> keep on <laughs> Yes. Is there is there a perception that um, R can't be as good as no, no, the, the ones like SAS? Because if you don't pay for it, obviously it can't be as good. No, I don't think it's just it's just a lack of knowledge about what software packages exist. Full stop. And um, also because in the public service, everyone's a generalist, so um, people move around from project to project. They don't have they don't have to develop any expertise in anything other than Excel, really. Um, and, uh, Grattan, uh, most people use R, or most of the quants use R, because mm. we're a not-profit and it's free, mm. and it's powerful. Mm. So when you present your findings to the government, they don't turn around and say, oh, but you used something we don't know about, no. you pay for it. Okay. Cool. Thanks very much. I'd love to chat to any of you afterwards. <laughs>